In detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. On the waves of memory. The steamship line on the Ili River. Every evening, the light keepers work hard to light the steamboats on their way up the big aquatic highway. The taming of an obstinate river is hard work. Those light keepers set waterway signs and lights. They show the depth of the channel and the shallows. The Equator steamboat is off on its first trip. It is operated by Terentai Orazbyakov, an experienced captain. This unique footage with Bon Voyage Comrades Farewell and also the first attempts of conquering the river have passed through the decades. An Illy Odyssey is how it started, the steamboat's destiny and an underwater town traveling on the waves of memory. As an engineer, he did everything properly. Unfortunately, the sources were poor, and so they failed to establish any good business. Then there was a storm. Some kind of natural anomaly occurred and washed the ships ashore. Chapter 1, People and Steamships. Diving into history, deep into 1881 and Central State Archive, here is a telegram to Governor General Kolpakovsky. We agreed to release the iron steamer out of England and to start sailing on the Ili. We're thinking about a carriage of passengers, goods, and all in all, we want to develop trading on the Ili. We're in a hurry because the ship has to be prepared before May 1882. Your Excellency, we hope that you won't refuse our sympathy. Signed by Poklevsky and Yuldashev. There are two main characters in this history, motors, to be correct. Let's speak further of each of them. Ivan Kozel Poklevsky's life is full of mystery and secrets, discoveries and failures. The Polish engineer Ivan Jan Poklevsky, also an engineer, migrated from Paris to Semirec in 1872. He designed and built the roads, bridges, fountains, mansions and even towns. Jarkent, for example. Jan Kozol Poklevsky designed this town. He was a remarkable person who was deported to this place. When China received Kulja, Ivan Ivanovich lost all his workshops, steel casting and mechanical, but he also stayed optimistic. This talented engineer had a new plan to develop a steamship company on the Ili. It is his motherland, the fact that his ancestors lived here and that his uncle, who lived in Siberia, used to do the same. Those reasons influenced him. The circumstances too, of course, because he had to come up with something else to survive. After the river had been explored carefully, he concluded that developing the steamship line was possible. The only thing needed was money. This is why he turned to a famous tradesman, the first guild tradesman of Verny town, Uvali Achun Yudashev. This man had countless riches at the time. People in Verny used to say that he surpassed other tradesmen, Pugasov, also the merchant Gabdul Valiev. He could work as a counterman at Yudashev's. There were many legends about Vali Achun how dozens of carts turned out to be hundreds, and that he kept all of the numbers in his head, and even that he owned Jacquent, unknowingly, of course. He had visitors in his 40-room house, and sitting in his chair, reminded some of a throne. 
Here he sat in his brocaded fairy hat, wearing his medals. This picture was what being painted. Part of the memories of George Ginns. A typical king, the tradesman was disparaged by his contemporaries, but he was a charismatic opportunist. Yodashev immediately noticed the potential in Poklevsky's project. Well, Jan Poklovsky had real support after negotiating with Wali Achun Yildashev and telegraphed to the military governor Kolpakovsky regarding the steamboat's release from England. Chapter 2. Struggling against the current. To be fair, their attempt of conquering the Ali wasn't the first. In the summer of 1854, they'd already tried. Another tradesman, Kuznetsov, decided to provide the people of Verney with food by water. A little above the Illy packet, there was a big and hideous longboat. It was built on the Balkash Lake's bank. And I saw the builders who brought it to the Illy packet. It took two weeks for them to go across the lake while being held back by strong wind. And after that, they had to go about 300 kilometers in two months. Pyotr Semyonov Tchanshansky wrote, The story has a sad ending. Impassable jungles, mosquitoes, flies, boars, and even tiger attacks. 120 days of tough adventure which took out all the profit from selling bread. After delivery, one quarter of grain cost five cows. After all, Kuznetsov went bankrupt and committed suicide. But his name will always be in the history of science and in the Imperial Geography Society's records. The idea of sailing steamers on the Ili was, of course, a fantasy back then. To be fair, even after 30 years, it wasn't that easy to do. Even then, it was the same sparsely populated and undeveloped land. The land was desperately needed to be invested in. The authorities prohibited deforestation high in the mountains. All the foothills were deforested. I saw a picture of Koktebe in an old magazine in Lenin's library. It was called Verigina's Mountain. There are also stumps, and the remainder of the mountain was covered with spruce trees. There was a real need for the development of this project, thanks to steamship company Chinese Kuja, which could have been supplied with bread of Semirechi, and Verni in its turn with coal. Vali Achun Zhuldashev had his own concerns about it. In these documents, we can see that Zhuldashev had some coal mines in China. The territory was ceded to China in 1881. Poklevsky also hoped to take his engineering tools from the workshops in Kulja. The prospects were good, but Yordashev had strict conditions. He insisted on the engineer investing in the project himself. Poklevsky borrowed 1,500 rubles from Kolpakovsky and had to pay it back after a year. The Steamship Society ordered a boat in England. Briefly, it was carried in disassembled form to St. Petersburg by sea, to Aralsk by train, and afterwards to Irtysh by truck. Then it was transported by barge to Semipalatinsk and by cart to the jetty. In the spring of 1882, the steamer Kolpakovsky was solemnly launched. This epical event happened near the Ili community. After that, on the 21st of April, the boat, loaded with bread, sailed in the direction of China. Chapter 3. A trip to a bright future. The new border could cause some problems, but the Governor-General suggested to load Kolpakovsky's boat with grain. 
Why? Because Chinese people needed bread, and half of the Ili River belonged to them. In order to avoid any attack on the steamer, they loaded it with grain. For a long time, people thought that it started sailing a year later. But recent sources from the archives show that it was in 1882. On the 4th of May in 1882, he freely got to the Suidun jetty, where he unloaded his cargo and was back on the 20th of May to the Ili jetty. And it wasn't the last time he did it this way. Kolpakovsky made two trips to Kurja and then one to Balkash, sailing 6,000 miles. They built three jetties in Kurja, Ilisk, and Jarkent, accordingly for this English ship. Boklevsky spent all summer on the steamer working as a captain and machinist. During the trips, he explored the channels, measured the riverbed, watched the conditions of sailing, and he also kept a journal. All of that let him find the ship's shortcomings. The draft too deep for this waterway, and the propeller did not fit the speed of the stream. Nikolai Ivlevs. A regional ethnographer's findings. However, the engineer still had hope. The hull could be enlarged, thereby the draft could decrease. The propeller could be changed. A barge and two more improved ships could be built, but only made of Altai iron. Poklevsky thought that Siberian iron was better than the foreign one. The gas problem could also be solved. Geological discoveries confirmed this plan. Naturally, the intelligence work took place in all Kazakhstan's regions, in Semipalatinsk Oblast and in the Semirechye Oblast as well. That's what the political exiles did. Tulendi Saptayakov found the coal mine. Poklevsky convinced the governor general of possible profits. The goods will cost less, the area will liven up, the reconstruction of the canal will allow people to grow rice. Water and wind engine manufacturing will become easier and by a cheaper price. But all of the dreams were washed away. He didn't ask for 1,500 rubles, but for 150,000, but wasn't granted. And moreover, they applied debtors' bondage to him. In between searching for money, he also tried to make the Illy fairy tale come true. So the steamboat failed. Epilogue An empty pier. The first Illy steamboat's fate was very sad. The ship was washed ashore, it was badly damaged, and they decided not to restore it. But some parts were salvaged. There's a part of the steamboat in the Semipalatinsk workshop, but the hull, with its boiler, are in Jarkent, of course. The steamer was covered with sand, and after 20 years, it was still there at the Illy Pier. The excerpt from the documents of 1908, posterity records the monument of the futility of steamship lines on the Illy River. End of quote. But the pre-revolutionary historian was wrong. It was a monument to a great dreamer. This project had potential, but arranging a regular steamboat service between two countries undoubtedly was a venture. Only after 40 years, with the government's help, could they organize reliable river transport. March the 25th. Enormous amounts of cargo had to be transported by the Ili River this year. They loaded the ships with cement for new buildings, villages and towns of the Republic. This cargo will reach the People's Republic of China.
The history of the Soviet steamship line wasn't very long, but created some mystery about a sunken city, underwater bell towers and floating coffins. Well, the story of Kapshagai Reservoir, Emergence is worthy of its own story.